Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. Most of us have seen movies or television shows where sharks have been portrayed as marauders who prey on unsuspecting swimmers or smaller fish in the sea. But many Wild Kingdom episodes illustrate how sharks and other predators are an important part of the food chain in our underwater world. Oceans cover 70% of our planet, yet we still have much to learn about this important ecosystem. Modern technology has enhanced our ability to study the oceans with minimal disruption to their habitat. Human involvement and recent legislation to protect underwater creatures allow for the resurgence of these many species. There's more good news to come in the Wild Kingdom, so sit back and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. One of the largest turtles in the world is the giant loggerhead, which returns as an adult to the beach where it was hatched in order to lay its eggs. In these same waters is found the sea snake, one of the most venomous reptiles in the world. There is much concern among scientists and conservationists for the survival of the giant loggerhead. So a research program is presently underway in the waters of the Coral Sea off Australia's port city of Gladstone, close to Heron Island on the Great Barrier Reef. A sleek sailboat, the Tropic Rover, is being used as both a base of operations and research vessel, and on hand to observe and participate in the often exciting activities at the Queensland National Parks and Wildlife Service headquarters on Heron Island is Wild Kingdom reporter Tom Allen. In the reefs surrounding Heron Island, a great number of sea turtles live, making it an ideal place to conduct turtle research. To capture and tag some of these turtles, Peter Gross and I will join the marine zoologist in charge of turtle research for Queensland's National Parks and Wildlife Service, Dr. Colin Limpus. How do you catch these turtles? Well, for the turtles living out in the shallow flats of the lagoon, we round them up in our speedboat, we leap out on them, catch them. Uh, we call it our turtle rodeo. Uh, for the turtles that are living out in the deeper water outside the reef, um, they're very difficult to catch in the daytime, so we tend to go out and catch them at night on scuba when we can sneak up on them and they can't see us. What's the plan for the rest of the day? Well, the tide's a bit low for us to go out into the lagoon to uh, chase the turtles now. Um, I suggest you guys go and have a dive. Great. Sounds terrific. We'll see you right after the dive. All right, thank you. Nice seeing you. In areas like this, where the sea turtles are found, sometimes there are sea snakes in the water. So we'll check that out now from this rubber boat. Our guide is a crew member of the Tropic Rover, John Hardy. He'll take us far out to the first reef beyond the shallows where we will be capturing the sea turtles later on. We'll make our first dive here to see if the migratory turtles have returned. We have about an hour, according to Peter. That should give us ample time to check out the reef below before we have to join the research team. Now, we're ready to dive. The exceptional clarity of the Coral Sea off Australia is a great aid to the researchers who enter this unusual marine world. Some of the corals look very much like vegetation, and it's hard to believe that these shrub-like growths are living animals and not plants. The coral reef makes a good hiding place for sea snakes, who often hunt their prey in this sort of habitat.
Though we will probably see some of the sea snakes, we first encounter a growing number of fish. To these fish, the human diver is a curiosity more than a threat. And when a small piece of fish is taken from the pouch and its odor fills the water, it immediately becomes obvious that they are unafraid and only want a share of the food. Most of these fish are red-throated emperors. I've used up all the bait, so now Peter and I may as well move on to where there are some larger coral formations. Because if the sea snakes are in this area at all, that's where they'll be. Just as we begin to approach the area of larger coral formations, a movement to one side draws our attention. It's a sea snake, a poisonous reptile with venom 50 times more deadly than a cobra's. Their potential danger is something we must keep in mind later as we search for turtles in these waters. A second sea snake twined about the base of a nearby branch coral gives us a chance to conduct a test of its temperament by gently picking it up. We wouldn't recommend that these snakes be touched by anyone unskilled in handling them, and we only do so here to ascertain what possible problems we might have. The fact that this snake's immediate objective is to try to get away rather than attack whatever is holding it clearly indicates that we will have little to worry about from this particular species. There's our first sighting of a mating pair of green sea turtles. Their journey here took many weeks. They have come from different places and may have individually traveled a thousand miles or more to meet in the waters of this breeding area. Both sexes are shy and usually react quickly to avoid possible danger. The brief sighting verified for us that the green sea turtles have returned and are mating. And though we haven't seen any of the giant loggerheads yet, they should be arriving soon too. Now we'll return to our boat and rejoin Dr. Olympus and his research team to assist in capturing and tagging some of the giant sea turtles. The Tropic Rover is riding at anchor, and both Peter Gross and Tom Allen are ready to leave the larger craft to join Colin Limpus to tag the giant loggerheads. They feel confident of success, since one of the big turtles was sighted a short while ago by Tom Allen. We'll be working with Colin and his associate, Emma Gairis, on this larger motorboat for the capturing of the turtles. It is not only roomier, but faster and more maneuverable than the rubber boat. Colin Limpus calls this type of capture method his turtle rodeo, which involves traveling at high speed to locate a turtle, then maneuvering to overtake it, with the object being to get right over the animal so we can dive on it. It's a green sea turtle, and its speed is phenomenal. Colin's got him, but getting it under control is another matter with an animal that can weigh up to 500 pounds. It 
It's important to get a rope around the front flipper, but that too is difficult since the turtle can hold its breath a lot longer than we can. Now that we're at the surface with this big green sea turtle, we can get some welcome help from Emma and Peter in the boat. The object is to secure the turtle to the side of the boat so it can be tagged and measured. An unexpected surge with its great strength, the rope is off and it's broken free. Colin has captured and measured most of the turtles that come here, but recapturing them periodically is necessary in order to establish growth rates and other important biological factors. Now we're ready for another attempt. Using this turtle rodeo method, Colin can capture and release up to 60 turtles a day. So many turtles have gathered here to breed that in moments, we're back in good position for our second effort. With a rope loop snugged over one of the strong front flippers, we now have the turtle fairly well secured, and Colin finds he can keep it under control best by holding it in a vertical position. While Colin and I hold the big turtle up, Peter and Emma will get the front flippers secured to the side of the boat. Tagging the turtles and keeping close records is extremely important. When tagged turtles are recaptured, the researchers can accurately determine how often they return here to breed, which is not every year. Some come back in two years, some not for eight or nine years. The research team has tagged and released nearly 40,000 turtles in this program, and the result is that Colin Limpus is accumulating much important information. The very survival of the sea turtles may be linked to this continuing program I am observing with Peter Gross today. The foundation of the sea turtle research is the tag attached to the trailing edge of the front flipper. Sometimes the researchers will place two tags on the same animal in case one is somehow lost. With each successive capture, more is learned about where it goes, when it breeds, and other information previously a mystery. By inspecting the inside of the turtle's mouth, Colin can see from the food particles what type of vegetation the turtle has been feeding on. Each turtle is carefully measured down the length of the shell. Repeated measurements over the years indicate its growth rate, enabling scientists to determine at what age it is sexually mature. The size of this one's shell and tail confirm that it is an adult male, and Colin estimates its age to be about 50 years. That concludes the examination of this turtle, so now he can be released to resume the breeding activities that brought him back to this area. The males never return to land once having entered the sea. Our next objective will be to capture another turtle to take it back to the National Park's base on Heron Island for a series of tests. It is in the shallow waters of these flats that the turtles converge in large numbers to mate. But once the courtship and the breeding period is over, the males immediately depart for the open sea, leaving the females to go ashore here to lay their eggs on the beaches in the area where they themselves were hatched. 
There's our next turtle just ahead. No time will be wasted tagging and taking measurements of this turtle here in the water. Instead, we'll simply get it into the boat and take it back to Heron Island for the test Dr. Olympus wants to perform. When the tests are concluded, he'll tag and measure the turtle before releasing it as one more animal playing its role in the continuing vital sea turtle study. Without the work these scientists are doing, the sea turtle might well become extinct here, as it already has in many other areas of the world. And though we have not yet caught a loggerhead, Dr. Olympus feels sure we'll get one after dark during our night dive. Darkness has fallen, and now that the Tropic Rover has anchored in deeper water, Colin and his assistants, Emma and Daryl, as well as Peter, and Tom Allen are ready to dive and attempt to tag some of the giant loggerheads at night. The brilliant glare of the underwater floodlights provides excellent illumination for the divers in the intense darkness of the nighttime sea. Here in the inky depths, both divers must be unusually alert for what might suddenly appear out of the darkness. Peter will hold the lights, leaving Tom free to search the eerie bottom. Somehow, unexpected encounters are more startling at night, and this one is no exception. A sea snake lying on the coral. In its usual way, its efforts are more directed toward escape than trying to attack. But it's a good reminder to us to keep on the alert at all times. Another one displays the wonderful grace with which these poisonous reptiles hunt their small fish prey among the corals in this marine world. But no matter how unaggressive such a snake may initially appear to be, one should never take it for granted. The formless mass clinging to the arms of a coral provides us with the opportunity for a close look at one of the more colorful and graceful creatures of the tropical sea. This is the animal that scientists call a nudibranch, but which is more commonly known as the Spanish dancer and with good reason, as it seems to swim in an extravagant swirl of a colorful Spanish gown.
glint in the distance, at first unidentifiable, gradually turns out to be the approach of the rest of the team, Colin Limpus and his two assistants, Emma and Daryl, joining us to start their underwater search for a loggerhead. Colin knows an area where some of the returning loggerheads feed at night, over in this direction, and he wants us all to follow him. Colin has led us to exactly what he's looking for, a giant loggerhead. Fortunately, it's not too big for us to handle easily, and we won't waste the opportunity. As it briefly surfaces for air, and before it can slip off into the darkness, Colin has it. It's important that Peter keep the action bathed in good light, so Emma can attach one of the titanium identification tags to its flipper. When fully grown, this turtle may weigh over 300 pounds. Numerous measurements already made to establish the growth rate of the loggerhead turtles indicate that these animals may not reach sexual maturity until they are approximately 50 years old. Perhaps this continuing research will help biologists save these magnificent marine reptiles from ultimate extinction. Until then, researchers like this team in the Coral Sea off Australia will continue to add to our growing knowledge of the species with each return of the giant sea turtles. Few wild animals are so gentle-natured as the loggerhead turtles and that has actually been to their detriment, since swimmers can approach them closely without being in jeopardy. The turtles are easily killed for meat, and the eggs are constantly being collected as food. So the research being done by Colin Olympus and other dedicated scientists is vital to the continuing efforts to preserve and protect one of the most fascinating reptiles in the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on, has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, helping people find Medicare solutions for over 50 years. To learn more about plan options or how to protect your kingdom, contact us today. Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.